Our next presentation is going to be by Club member Ron Yu, uh, who has some photos for us in the story. So, Ron, you have the floor. Great. Thank you, Matt. Um, I, I guess I ought to start by saying that, you know, I, I, I drove with my wife out to a uh, suburb of Austin, you know, as as uh, as Ken was saying, the expectation was for clear skies there, but um, even a week or so beforehand, it was looking pretty iffy the whole time. Uh, we have an old graduate school uh, colleague of both my wife and I lives out there. So we stayed near him in Round Rock uh, with the intent that we were going to set up in his yard uh, the night before, get everything polar aligned and ready to go. <clears throat> uh, we did that. But unfortunately, the morning of the eclipse, the weather forecast was looking pretty, pretty bad. Uh, and I had another friend who was out at uh, Burnett, Texas, about an hour, I would say, west, northwest of us, near a lake. And she was saying that the locals there were claiming that the lake sucked all the clouds over it. And as long as they weren't too heavy, they would normally get clearish skies. So at nine o'clock in the morning, I scooted from Round Rock to Burnett, Texas, got set up, got polar aligned surprisingly well, uh, and was taking pictures in and out of the clouds. It, it would cloud up and then it would clear up and then it would cloud up again. <clears throat> so it was, uh, my, my plan was to get a nice series of, of images that I could kind of showcase how the eclipse was progressing. That, that didn't happen. <laughs> uh, I did manage to get, like I said, two rigs set up. They were all automated. So my intent there was that I could enjoy the visual spectacle while the cameras were clicking away. One was on a, an astronomy mount, a mighty mount, with a telescope, uh, stellar view. And another was just on a um, Skywatcher tracker taking pictures with a uh, Canon EOS 80D. Uh, this one is actually of totality. This one was taken with the Canon. Uh, surprisingly, even without any magnification, you could see that uh, prominence there at the, at the base very vividly uh, without without any magnification at all. It was really spectacular. Um, this shot, I think, was uh, one two fiftieth of a second, I think. Uh, maybe one sixtieth. I, I, I'm not quite sure. They, they were snapping through at different exposure lengths. Uh, it was f8. I think the, the lens was set at 250 millimeters. Uh, I was really happy with this this picture. Uh, the next one I have, let's see if I can get it to go. Uh, no, come on. How do you go next? Let's see here. Maybe I need to get rid of these guys on the right. There we go. Um, so this was taken through the stellar view. Uh, one of the things I found out after afterward when I got home and was looking at the pictures is I really sh probably could have gotten away with a, sl uh, a slower, uh, faster speed on the camera uh, because most of the, the, the prominences were, were blown out. But I think nevertheless, uh, in, in looking at it, I actually think having them blown out a little bit might have helped because you can start to see, I'm not sure if you can see my mouse, but you can start to see some of the, the arcs in this, perturb, in this uh, prominence. And in the next one, it's even more. So this is, um, this I believe was second contact. And I believe this was third contact. Look at that. You can really see the, the arcing between the prominences down there. This is that that really bright one that you could see, you know, almost naked eye. So I, I, I was extremely happy with these, even though the, the whites are completely blown out. Um, this was my picture of the diamond ring. 
again, as, as things were going. Um, one of the things that I found out is because I changed location and I had everything for the, for the picture taking automated at specific times, the times were off probably by, I don't know, 30 seconds maybe. So I completely missed the diamond ring on the other side. But I did manage to snap this one. And then this was my HDR version of the totality. So this was a, a composite of, I think, about five or six images at various exposures. Um, processed really to, to, to get all the detail out that I can. The thing that I thought was really surprising, aside from these all these little arcs that you see, the magnetic arcs, I did manage to get a couple stars in there as well. So I, I was pretty happy with that as in addition to the, the pictures themselves. Um, and I guess that's about it for now. All right, thank you. Okay, I'll go ahead and stop. Okay. I can give a, a little story. I don't have pictures of my trip. I got my little Honda Accord and drove to Addison, Texas, and uh, by myself. And the the uh, weather reports were not good. Um, now a lot of you remember Jay Zachs, his wife had gotten two rooms and she flew in. And so I said, you still have that room available? And she goes, yeah. So I grabbed the other room from her and uh, we met at the hotel. And it was that night, it was total overcast. And she goes, there are supposed to be two other people that, you know, you know, we, we're going to come with her, you know, you know, you know not on the plane, but, a, you know, meet her at the airport kind of thing. And they bailed because, and I said, oh, ye of little faith, you know. And uh, then that morning, the morning of the eclipse, it was total overcast. And then, but it was getting lighter, you know. And then just before the eclipse, the clouds parted. Now, we still had a few, you know, those wispy clouds that, that's, that's you know, for the sun, it's no problem at all. And uh, the, the, we had the eclipse and we could see it fine. It was great. Then the clouds came back. And we had thunderstorms that night. So, you know, you know, you just, you just have to pray. You say, Lord, I've done everything I can. If everything else is up to you. <laughs> you know, and uh, so anyway, uh, Gail and I, uh, well, we had a hotel that was in the path of totality. So we had to get up that morning and walk out to the pool area. Uh, half job. So uh, now we could have gotten a few more seconds. I mean, you know, if we, I guess, got right smack in the, the middle of the, the pack, but it was, it wouldn't have been worth it, you know? So uh, it was great. We just <laughs> pulled up a chair and, and put our uh, solar glasses on and watched it. And then when it became, uh, full uh we pulled out the binoculars and just looked at it regular and uh and then i said okay i gotta stop using the binoculars and then 10 seconds later the sun popped out <laughs> so and we had it it was total for three minutes and uh 32 seconds where we were wow. i mean yeah we could have gone to a four minute place but you know fighting all that traffic and considering we walked out the door and there it was. <laughs> and uh, so it was great. I mean, it, I mean, when it was lightning and thundering that night, I mean, those were huge drops. I mean, it's not like California drops. You know, these things were, oh, my gosh, is it going to bust? It? And then it started to hail. You know, I was wondering if it was going to go through my windshield, you know. So but anyway, success. Although none of my pictures came out because. They, they didn't. <laughs> okay.
Did anyone here have written quotes? Cool. And I think now, that there we go. So that was the that was the itinerary. Ten days down to the Mexican Riviera. We were on the Discovery Princess, which is basically a brand new ship. It was launched at the end of March, 2023. And so it was uh, about one year and one week in service uh, when I got on board on April 3rd. It's a big ship, it's Panamax Plus. So it's over a thousand feet long, uh, weighs 145,000 tons and had a crew of 1,600 and 3,500 passengers. So a little over 5,000 folks on board. I didn't have to take the Eclipse glasses this time, fortunately. They had Princess <laughs> the Eclipse glasses already arranged in advance. Uh, last year when I did my first one of these, the Eclipse cruise around Australia, they had put that together at the last minute, and I got to fly to Australia with 3,000 pairs of molded paper Eclipse glasses in my luggage, which was about as much as it sounds like. Uh, so this time, my brother Todd uh, got to go with me, and we had a great time. He's two years younger than I am. Three times on that freaking cruise, people asked if he was my son. <laughs> Apparently, those two years that separate us were hard years. But we had a really good time. Uh, we had a little room, a little cozy room uh, to share. Um, and we got to do some tour excursions. That's the cathedral in Mazatlan. Mazatlan, we were, on, we were ashore. Uh, we put into Mazatlan the day before the eclipse. And it was a madhouse. And I realized not only is Mazatlan itself a big city of half a million people, but because it's a big city and it's a resort city and it's right on the coast and it was going to be on the path of totality, it had brought tourists from all over Mexico all over Latin America, all over the United States. Um, so not only is it a big city to begin with, but it was just thronged with people. I was one of two speakers on the cruise. Actually, they had, they didn't get me until December or January. Um, the speaker that they had arranged previously is Shelly Bonus, who is worked at Mount Wilson for many years. She's been our telescope operator. Yeah several times when we've gone up to Mount Wilson and she's taught at UCLA for a long time. Uh, she's now living on the East Coast, um, but she still has a hand in uh, Southern California astronomy uh, and education. So she was the person they already had arranged and they got in touch and said, hey, it's such a big cruise. We have so much interest in the eclipse. We'd like to have a second speaker. Would you be the sidekick speaker? Like, well, sure, I'll take the hit. I'll do that. Uh, and actually, it was really great to get to know Shelly and get to work with her. She is a font of fascinating stories. Um, when she was younger, she used to frequent a diner that was right across the street from the gym where Arnold Schwarzenegger used to work out before he was famous. So she knew Arnie before he was a name. Um, so she's sort of like... Uh, the reverse Forrest Gump of astronomy, reverse in that she's really smart. And, but she has, she's apparently met just about everybody in the world and has a story to tell about them. So I ended up giving some talks myself and doing some filming for the, the ship has its own morning show called The Wake Show. Uh, and so there I am uh, getting interviewed by Cole, uh, the entertainment director uh, for The Wake Show. And uh, I have this meteorite that I brought for show and tell. It's a piece of the Sokotialin meteorite. This um, blew up in the atmosphere over far eastern Russia back in 1947 with the force of a small atomic bomb. Basically shotgunned the Sokotialin mountains with shrapnel from the size of a piano down to the size of a pea. And this is a piece of that shrapnel that got ripped apart basically against the bedrock of the mountains. So I've had this, this is the first meteorite I got. I got it at RTMC um, almost a decade ago with money from my first check from Sky and Telescope. And so I took it on the cruise last year and I wanted people to get to see it, but there are too many people on the cruise to make it feasible to pass around. So I just told people when I gave my talks, hey, if you see me around the ship, stop me 
and asked to see the meteorite. So they did. So I did the same thing this cruise, and I must have it must have been handled by hundreds of people, which is great. I love that, except for the 10-month-old baby that grabbed the meteorite and immediately stuck it in her mouth. Yeah. <laughs> um, but this is how we build immune systems. Yeah. Uh, so it turned out to be a great way to meet people because um, – uh, the guy there is Tim. I met him on one of the shore excursions. He said, you didn't bring the meteorite with you ashore. And I was like, yeah, I did. Um, the lady in the hallway there was turned out to, she won space trivia. And then she turned out to be my neighbor down the hall. Um, so th uh, after all that, I decided it was my meteorite. Um, <laughs> I was doing evening stargazing sessions. And one of the people said that the meteorite should have its own social media profile. So now Matt's meteorite has a Facebook page. Yeah, <laughs> uh, I tried to start an Instagram account for it, but it was shut down for being inauthentic because I couldn't prove that I was a billion year old piece of iron. So, well, if if the meteorite gets its own social media, maybe it should be media right. Oh, uh, that's uh, really that's the best that's the best suggestion I've groaned at this year. <laughs> um, so then it got to eclipse day. Off in the distance, you can see other ships. So there's me and Shelly and Cole. And uh, off in the distance, you can see our, uh, so we're on the Discovery Princess. That's the Emerald Princess in the middle distance. And then way off on the horizon, there were a couple of Holland America ships, including Claire, I presume, the ship that you were on. Yeah, so I saw you, I saw you on the horizon across the distance, but I don't know. I would have waved. Um, I did wave, but uh, you, you know, I couldn't tell if you're waving back, so. <laughs> so we had really nice, so there were clouds off on the horizon, but there were no clouds overhead. We had great conditions. Um, I was doing some pinhole uh, projection. I cut out a little, um, used index card, cut out a little map of the west coast of Mexico and picked out our ports of call um, and the date, which is the same thing I did in Australia last year. So I'm going to do this for everyone and try to collect the whole set, however <laughs> many I get to do. So in Australia, that was a hybrid eclipse, um, annular to total to annular again, but the cruise got close to the center of the path, but not enough to see totality. And it was, their schedule was already set. They couldn't run all the way to the path of totality. So even though it was, it was clear, and even though some people just maybe a hundred miles north of us got to see totality. We had just a deep partial. So it was my second eclipse cruise, um, but my first total eclipse from a ship, and it was my second total, the other one having been the one in 2017 that I saw from Alliance, Nebraska. So um, Ken showed those maps and showed that the path of this eclipse, um, the path of totality was much wider. The shout of the moon was larger because it was closer to earth. Uh, near perigee as, as he mentioned so i think in 2017 in nebraska we got about two and a half minutes of totality and the longest totality for this one was four minutes 28 seconds pretty near the middle of mexico where we were it was uh four minutes and 25 or 26 seconds and it was pretty good because the second totality started i had a four minute 25 second countdown timer going on my phones that I would know when it was time to stop messing around and get ready to put the glasses back on. And even with four and a half minutes, it went so fast. Uh, my favorite terrestrial effect of the eclipse is the 360 degree sunset. And it was spectacular where we were at. And afterwards, uh, I'll show some pictures of the eclipse that the ship photographer took, but they were serving a drink on board called the Total Eclipse, um, which had an impressive amount and variety of alcohol for something that tasted more or less like orange juice. They were pretty dangerous. Somebody brought me one after totality because uh, Shelly and I had been up there doing shipwide broadcasts. That's the ship's photographer, Mao, um, who really knew his stuff and got pictures of the corona and of the prominences. Um, so this is the big prominence that you saw better in uh, Ron's photo. And in Ron's photo, you can see that there's like a little, a hole in that prominence. It's a giant arc, basically a plasma off the surface of the sun. And it's so big that 
our planet Earth would fit right through the hole in that arc of plasma. So it's many, many times bigger than Earth in total. I really liked Mao's diamond ring photo. It was a very mm -hmm. diamond, diamond ring photo. <laughs> That's really so it was a great eclipse. We had great conditions. Um, and I hope I get the opportunity to do some more of that stuff because uh, I've got the bug now. Um, and then uh, afterwards, they had a bunch of uh, mouse photos uh, for sale on the ship. Uh, so I got some prints. And then coincidentally, just as the eclipse was getting me all interested in the celestial mechanics of the um, sun, earth, and moon, Lego came out with this Technic Orrery that you build, you turn the hand crank here. Folks uh, here live in Pumona in the room have seen it. You turn the hand crank, the sun rotates on its axis, the earth rotates on its realistically canted axis. The moon goes around the earth, the earth and moon go around the sun, and the earth's tilt even lines up with the seasons. And there's a little pointer over here that tells you which month you're in. And there's a pointer on the moon that tells you which moon phase you're in. So I thought it'd be a pretty cool um, educational thing that I could use at outreach events and schools and things to talk to people about why moon phases happen, why seasons happen, and why eclipses happen. So that just came out. It's been on store shelves for maybe a month or two. Uh, there's a close-up. And uh, I think it's a pretty cool thing. So if you're interested, uh, track it down. I've, I've, I've seen them on the shelves at Barnes & Noble and Target and other places. And I think that's it. So thank you for your attention.